Hello, I'm Dr. Paula Rosen. I'm uh, honored to be here with Dr. Bruce Stillman, the president of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, he has been here since 1979, came from Australia, and the United States is so lucky to have him here. Uh, he assumed the presidency in 2003, and may I call you Bruce? Yes. Please tell us something about the important and seminal work that you're doing here at the laboratory. Well, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory focuses on four areas of science, uh, cancer, neuroscience, plant biology, and quantitative biology, which is the integration of mathematics and computer science into an analyzing large data. Our main area of research is cancer. We're a National Cancer Institute designated cancer center, and we've got some very exciting programs on cancer therapeutics, uh, discovering new targets for cancer therapy, and then taking that into the clinic. Are we making progress in, the, uh, in battling cancer? So the biggest problem with cancer is that it's not just one disease, it's many, many different diseases. And even within one tissue organ, such as breast cancer, there are many different types of breast cancer. Uh, pathologists have known this for a long time, but with the sequencing of the human genome, we now know the underlying genetics of cancer and we can identify different subtypes. And so the name of the game now is to identify precision therapies that are linked to the different genetics. And that is working very well. And there's cancer death rates have come down very, very significantly, not in all cancers, but in many cancers. Which particular ones? I think well, the leukemia best cancers, is one. Yes, the best cancers are leukemia, but also breast cancer, the death rates are coming down in that, and colon cancer. In part, that's due to early diagnosis. The worst cancers are pancreas cancer, uh, malignant melanoma, and, uh, and other cancers that, such as ovarian cancer that can't be detected very early. Patients come in with cancers uh, at a late stage, and they're very difficult to treat. However, the new targeting of uh, drugs to specific drug targets that are linked to the genetics of cancer is having a big impact, and I think will have a big impact over the next 10 years. So we know the tragic uh, diagnosis of pancreatic cancer or ovarian cancer. And as you said, they're silent killers. Um, have we made any progress in the area of pancreatic cancer, for example? Well, unfortunately, not much. Uh, and pancreas cancer is one of the most difficult, mainly because it's very difficult to do early diagnosis. We're working on uh, developing a, what are called biomarkers that are that is, molecular signatures of cancer that might be circulating in the blood. And uh, we're also working on new therapeutics for pancreas cancer, but it is still one of the most untreatable cancers that uh, one can get. And unfortunately, it is increasing in numbers. Why is, is there any particular reason? We don't know why. Um, I think it's partially because the U.S. population is aging significantly. But uh, that and other gastrointestinal cancers such as esophageal cancer are increasing, not dramatically, but in significant numbers that it's of concern. And so there's a major effort here on pancreas cancer in collaboration with a Long Island foundation called the Luskarten Foundation, which was established specifically to address pancreas cancer. Do you collaborate with other institutions, uh, for example, Sloan Kettering, which has such a fine reputation in cancer research and detection? Cure. Yes, we collaborate with a lot of clinical centers. In fact, we have collaborations with about 40 clinical centers worldwide. In pancreas cancer, we have a, a clinical collaboration with a consortium that involves Johns Hopkins University, Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber in Boston, and MD Anderson in uh, Houston. And uh, that clinical consortium uh, focuses in on uh, developing uh, therapies out of research done at Cold Spring Harbor, MIT, and Johns Hopkins. So we do a lot of collaborations. Uh, one of our uh, faculty is a clinician who also is treating patients at Sloan Kettering. I can't help but note that this iconic place was the birthplace for Watson and Crick and the DNA mm -hmm. discovery that read to, led to their Nobel Prize. Um, Following along in that, uh, lab here is not strictly a lab in Cold Spring Harbor. It is 
you have a facility in China, and you have something in oh. Harlem and mm -hmm. Manhattan. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Well, Cold Spring Harbor is not just a research institution. Uh, we're 123 years old, and we were started really as an educational institution in teaching science to people who want to learn about science. And so a large program that we have is in science education. And the, off, the sites that uh, are remote from Cold Spring Harbor, such as, such as the site in China, and also the one in New York City, are really focused on science education. In China, we have a conference center where we uh, host scientific meetings and some courses. And that's for the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor, we have a large conference center that brings over about 10,000 scientists to Cold Spring Harbor each year Amazing. to attend meetings and courses. But the one in New York City is a uh, small center that was done in collaboration with the Department of Education. And we have a in a school, the John S. Roberts School uh, in East Harlem, we have a science teaching laboratory where we train teachers and students from the city school systems. You know, of all the honors that have been bestowed upon you personally, as well as the lab, what is what are you the proudest of? What's the most meaningful to you? Well, actually, I think the most meaningful to me has actually been a president of Cosmic Harbor Laboratory. It is a really remarkable institution. Uh, it has had some amazing people uh, as my predecessors, including James Watson, who, uh, as you pointed out, won the Nobel Prize with Francis Crick and Morris Wilkins for DNA. And uh, the science that's gone on here and the impact of our science education uh, is, I think, second to no other institution in the United States. I want to just uh, dwell for a moment on women in science and women in the lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a very famous scientist here, uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara McClintock, yes. who won the Nobel as well. And she comes, she did her work here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Can you tell us a little bit about her and about other women that you have here in the lab? Yeah, well, Barbara was one of eight Nobel laureates that worked at Cold Spring Harbor. She was here from 1941 until her death in the early 90s. And she worked in the lab every day, almost up until the time she died. She was a remarkable lady. In fact, my laboratory was next to hers for a long time. And she really was very, very insightful. In fact, I think she was probably one of the three greatest geneticists that have ever lived. Uh, the others being uh, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan from Columbia University and Gregor Mendel, who started the yes. whole field. Barbara was had an enormous impact in multiple fields. And she could have won multiple Nobel Prizes for what she did. But her work that she won the Nobel Prize for was uh, done in the 1940s, and we're only now really understanding what she knew back in the 1940s. We have other women uh, here on our faculty. Um, in fact, our recently uh, recent dean of our graduate school was a, a woman who's a structural biologist mm -hmm. who works on determining the three-dimensional structures of proteins. And uh, we have uh, other women scientists who work on cancer, in plant biology, and uh, in neuroscience. So there's a place for women. It's, a, ha a, it's a haven. There's a place for women in science, and about 50% of our graduate students and over 50% of the people who come here to attend our meetings now are women. There's a lot of women going into science. One of the difficult things, though, is making the transition from the training uh, uh, period, which is undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral studies, uh, making that transition to become faculty. And uh, there's a big drop-off in, in women at that level, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for it. But I think one of the uh, big challenges for institutions is how do you make it easier for women to be scientists, but also to have uh, family and other things. So. We have an on-site childcare center, which uh, makes uh, it a lot easier for not only women faculty, but for postdocs and students sure. who, to have children. Um, last question before we wrap. What prompted you to come from Australia to the United States? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Cold Spring Harbor is, among scientists, is a really, uh, truly very famous place. And I was a graduate student in Australia. I was working on... Uh, some science related to cancer. 
And I wanted to go and get some overseas experience, and I looked around, and there were really only two places that I thought about going, and one of them was Cold Spring Harbor. What was the other one? The other one was actually in Sweden, where I actually had accepted a job. Under uh, Karolinska. Under Karolinska. No, no, actually just north of there in Uppsala. Okay. And I accepted a job there. But I came to Cold Spring Harbor because it gave a young, it gives young scientists the freedom to do what they want to do. And I had that freedom. And uh, things just took off so well that I was offered a faculty position here and then grew through the ranks and fortunate to be head of it. And I think the other reason is that um, Cold Spring Harbor does have a very big impact and particularly through our education program. So that's uh, one of the things I think is most unique about Cold Spring Harbor. Well, I think we're an education newspaper and we are so delighted to be here to hear about your outstanding and impactful education programs. You are really developing the next generation of scientists in our nation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure.